Good afternoon, Facebooks. Good afternoon, friends. Hi, everybody. It is really nice to be here. I'm uh, I'm having a much better day than yesterday. Not hard, but you know that's that's the way it goes. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear who's on board and who's going to be joining. I'll take a little time to let everybody kind of filter in uh, before I get started, because I got a tight ship to run today. I was a bit of an idiot uh, back when I booked my last hair appointment. And I said, yeah, 115 would be great. And yeah, so that's an hour and 15 minutes from now. Luckily, I just literally walk over that way because I absolutely love um, being able to support local businesses. So I just tunnel over there. It takes me five minutes, but uh, there's a little bit of tear down that I have to do in this area. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me because I was rocking out. I mean, not rocking out. I was, I was jiving, I guess to some tunes, like literally as I'm watching the countdown, 10, nine, I'm like, this is a great song. I'm having a great time. And I'm just, whoa, crap. And I knew my AirPods were not hooked up to the computer and they were hooked up to my phone. Really like, don't do this kind of thing, you guys. It's just crazy. All right, let's see what's happening. Graham Wilcock, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Sunny Devon, as always. And thank you for your message yesterday. I really appreciated it. The at least one of the Zeds are on board, uh, perhaps uh, the whole family, uh, my favorite Calgary family here. Good to see you, Dennis. Uh, Carlos, saluted this book, Rep Dump, in, indeed. Uh, Carlos is one of my friends from the Dominican Republic. So, hola, como estas? I hope everything is well over there and you, you guys are coping all right with the, uh, the pandemic and all that kind of thing. Fingers crossed for you guys. Simon, hi, good to see you. I don't know what I would do if you didn't show up. I think I would feel like, wait, I feel like my left arm is missing or something like that. Simon's just fantastic. Liam, greetings, good to see you as always. And uh, Simon, you are very welcome for the physician webinar last week. I am planning the next one. Now we had kind of talked about what I might do. Um, dangerous shots on goal was a topic, but I'm actually gonna do that today. More on that in a sec, because um, it's not, uh, anyway, it's a long story, but I was thinking maybe obstruction as the next webinar. That would take up a good, if I say it'll take an hour and 15 minutes, it'll probably take two hours. And uh, yeah, that would be really, I think maybe a, a lovely topic to go through because I do have some really interesting techniques and tips that I think can work out really well for obstruction. So I don't know. Let me know. What do you think? What would you like let's say you had you know a few dollars in your pocket and you wanted to attend a webinar what would you want me to talk about and to discuss with me and teach me some things about let me know uh let's see oh caroline great to see you still raining in the hashtag standard there you go <laughs> martin stoneman i tell you you guys the banter is just so good. I don't know how you can even disagree about the weather, but uh, typical umpires, that's the way it goes. Uh, Sarah, hi, good to see you from Zim. I hope uh, I hope you're doing okay over there. I, I read all your Facebook posts to find out how things are going, and uh, I'm always I'm always thinking of you and, and hoping that uh, things improve as time goes on. I know you love your home, so good stuff. Okay, um, yeah, let's kind of get started. I'm again, well, I'm not really experimenting with a new setup. I'm kicking back to my Empire at Home setup a little bit more with technology, but I also have my iPad in case I have a brain fart and I don't know what to do, or I do need that pitch diagram. I don't think so with what we're covering today, but for those of you who had a chance to look at it, yesterday is really Tuesday. Um, I decided that I would go easier on myself and um, I would launch into something just super calm and standard and nothing that anybody has an argument about. And I thought dangerous shots on goal would be a great place. I know, right? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm a total idiot. But you know what? Chris Butler got back to me on Facebook, uh, yesterday, I think, and said, Hey, what about the dangerous shots on goal? You promised me. And I'm like, Oh, damn it. People are just so, you know, they're so sharp and they're not letting me off the hook. So we're going to start with that. We're going to talk about, uh, geez, I, I don't remember. I just prepared this last night. Uh, we're going to talk about early breaking by attackers. 
we're going to talk about head injuries and how do you get to the next level. So if you have something that you want me to discuss in that roundabout idea-like way and talk about tips or techniques and things like that, things that you wouldn't expect in a rules analysis or something like that, let's bring it on. Um, a little feedback on a workshop or intensive aerial ball thought process and working through your partner, working through, <laughs> you don't want to work through your partner. That's probably possession and that's bad. Um, so working with your partner to be consistent. That's a really good one. I could do one on aerials. You're absolutely right. Oh, and Neil Herman's here, my evil friend. Thank you. <laughs> Doing much better. Thanks for the kind note yesterday as well. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. Let's let's do this. Um, hmm. Let me see if I can remember what I'm doing now. So we had a question. It was so this was what Chris Butler was bringing to my attention. Sorry, I'm coming to it. Uh, it obviously this was posted on a different forum uh, a week or so ago. And this is a question that comes up literally every single time that people want to talk about uh, things on the internet. The whole idea, sorry, I'm trying to get myself into a picture on picture here and it's not working. So I'll just flip back to this. The thing about the dangerous ball and shots on goal is that it has been hashed so, so much uh, over the years, and I have been on um, internet forums where literally Godwin's Law was invoked. And when we got to the point of somebody accusing somebody else of being Hitler, it it was it, it kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So it's it's not a lot of fun to talk about in a lot of ways because people get very polarized. This is like. I don't know, the idea of wearing masks in the US or gun control in the US or pretty much anything in the US. It just seems to split people down the, into different camps that it's always dangerous or it can never be dangerous. And I really think we have to understand that this is an area of nuance. And let's dissect all of the things that go into this so I made very sure that I went through all the rules this time. I am not going to let you guys down again today. I went back to the foreword of the rule book, responsibility and liability that players are expected to be safe with each other. That's echoed in uh, section nine of the rule book that players are just expected to act responsible, responsible at all times, responsibly. I could speak English, but I'd rather not. The full section of nine and nine eight is where everybody focuses their, their attention. Uh, players must not play the balls dangerously, blah, blah, blah. It can, it can be considered dangerous. It is also considered dangerous as the rules when it causes legitimate evasive action by opponents. And there is also, I wanna bring these rules to your attention. You're probably wondering why is Keely putting up five two? that the team scoring the most goals is the winner. Trust me, it's related. Just wait till I get there. Also 9-11, that field players must not stop the ball with any part of their body. And the player only commits a defense if they gain advantage or if they position themselves with the intention of stopping the ball in this way. And the very last rule I'm gonna bring to your attention as we couch this discussion in lots of nuance and context. 10.2, goalkeepers can use their feet, stick, leg, legs, leg guards, or any other part of their body to basically stop the ball and deflect the ball over the end line. So if you didn't know, now you do. Those are all the rules that we're gonna talk about. So one of the big problems that we have when we start talking about uh, shots on goal is that we just focus on 9.8 and we ignore all those other ones but we have to consider everything because this is so much about the spirit of the game there are also many different kinds of shots on goal there's a lot of variety uh, there are on the penalty corner shots at goal that go past a defender on the post uh, there are times when a defender is close to an opponent 
Uh, if the defender isn't close to their opponent, I'm not really sure what they're doing, but if I were a coach, I wouldn't be too impressed. There's different locations in the circle from where the shot can be launched um, and where a defender could potentially be struck or be missed by the ball. So the people who take that always danger, danger is danger, no matter what, camp will say that even a shot on goal towards a field player defender who is standing on the goal line that they should be treated the same way as you treat somebody out in the uh in the rest of the circle and yeah no it just can't work that way and let me go through why this is my meter stick okay to determine whether something's dangerous you calculate in your brain whether that defender at that level of play can reasonably expected reasonably be expected to be able to play the ball and to protect themselves and want to play the ball however it's launched at them so if it's a it's a, if it's an errant pass if it's an aerial if it's if it's a shot on goal can that defender at that level of play do they have enough time do they have enough space do they have enough focus and concentration so we're we're looking at that difference between that legitimate evasive action and the non a player who goes for the ball and misses is not going to be considered to be legitimately evading the ball so the reason we have five meters in the rule book all over the place for a reason and it's not just because somebody one day went hmm, five meters that sounds like a nice you know round number um let's go with that it's that it's actually a really interesting metric that always pretty much allows you at any level of play you're probably going to be able at five meters or further to be able to protect yourself from a ball that is hit at you so that's why on free hits players need to stand five meters away it's for their own safety actually is so that they will have time to actively try to play the ball rather than have to get out of the way and take that legitimate evasive action the five meter distance when you are determining whether a player hit with a drag flick on a penalty corner and the height at which it hits them five meters is important and it has that same metric of can a player be expected to protect themselves and that sort of thing um in in indoor it's three meters and it's different because indoor you know that the ball isn't well you sure hope the ball isn't going to be getting raised at you anywhere else on the floor and that sort of thing so there's a there's a really elegant logic to it and that's what we want to keep in mind so let me show you some examples of play uh, shots on goal that are dangerous. And when I see comments on the internet that say international umpires never call shots on goal dangerous, they're real jerks and they don't understand. Um, yeah, you're just absolutely wrong. Let me show you with this montage. Ha! Oops, the other montage. Come on, command five. Oh, seriously? Okay, we're going to try it this way. I got this. Okay, <laughs> fun with technology. So this is just a segment of play where you see that the Australian defender is inside the circle and marking a player and the ball gets deflected off the Spaniard with whom she's, she's in close proximity. If that's not her mark, it's pretty close to her mark. And it gets called as dangerous because it gets flicked up at her. Let's go back to that because I wasn't focused and I want to see it again. All the way back kids okay here we go so it's not actually a market somebody who gets close but that is less than five meters at that distance and you can't expect a defender at even that level of play to be able to defend themselves so that is amber called dangerous right off the bat and you know the spaniards uh wanted a penalty corner and they lost so she definitely got that right very similar, here's a very close distance, a ball that gets actually struck. Now there can be an argument that that was the first hit on the penalty corner, so it didn't matter if it was dangerous or not. But even if it had been a flick, 
I think this would have absolutely been considered dangerous. That player wasn't on the line. They were marking a player and they were at such a close distance they couldn't protect themselves. And here's another example. I put this on a Feature Friday or an Ask, S Ask FHU recently um, where the, the defender, again, was that close on that shot at goal that when it got raised into him, it was dangerous. And he wasn't simply blocking the goal. He was coming to close on the ball carrier. Now, you can see that the attackers didn't really love that call, which is fine. But it's, it's you know, when, when Gar Gareth explains this, you know, to the captain and the other players and goes through the process, he manages to sort of talk them down off their, um, well, some of them anyway, off their indignation and convince them that, you know, hey, this is what I took into account was how far, whether the shot was going on goal or not, all that kind of stuff. And boom, it was definitely considered dangerous. Um, let's see if I can find this file. Yeah, I know what I did here. I'm going to find this because it's really important. I got in touch with my good friend, Soledad, because she had a great video of a danger call that, um, we believe should have been made and so i'm gonna find it i'm gonna pull it up to you <laughs> i'm gonna see and I'll, I'll look at some of the comments at the same time um half courts here good to see you thanks jenks sorry i can't see you through all those yards uh martin stoneman how many times has a defender been hit by a reckless raised hit cannot avoid and the umpire gives a Exactly. Is the ball in the goal? No, it was shot at a defender. That's that's a pretty good response. I really like that. And very fair. Okay, I think I found it. So I'm going to go back to an example where uh, an umpire really probably got it wrong. Here it comes. Nope. Not yet. Here, <laughs> Whew. so this was actually in 2014 at uh, the Europeans. And you can see this is one of those reversed hit shots. It gets called a goal, but what you wanna look at is that although one of the, def of the two defenders who I think took very legitimate evasive action, one of them was, you know, uh, KRW there was pretty close to the end line she was marking a player who also had to duck out of the way. So she was not in a position where she was attempting to pr protect the goal. She was marking her player. as She is absolutely expected to do that is regular hockey behavior. So when we see this replay ball gets dribbled across the top of the circle, here comes the Tomo and yeah, it's absolutely shot on goal, but it is going through that traffic and yeah, there's actually, you know, four players, although two of them don't count because you can't cause danger to your teammates, which is kind of weird. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's where we are at um, with dangerous shots on goal. Now, if that interpretation seems unfair to you and you think that defenders should be entitled to protection if they stand on the line and they act as another goalkeeper, but without goalkeeping privileges, consider what any smart coach would do in that situation, which would be on any penalty corner where a drag flicker might be present or not present, stick your four defenders uh, flanking your goalkeeper and say, I dare you to find a safe place to shoot at. Okay. It is absolutely incomprehensible in the way that our game goes. Do I like penalty corners? Do I like drag flicks? Do I like seeing players putting themselves at risk like that? Absolutely not. I hate it. I don't really like penalty corners anyway, to be totally honest. And I hate drag flicks. I just think they're, I don't know. It's an impressive technique, but it is boring. It looks the same all the time. I want, I want that excitement of cool things. So should defenders be allowed 
to take a goalkeeper-like position without the protection of the privileges of a goalkeeper? I don't think so. Can we make a rule against that? Maybe. I don't think so either. But should the entire penalty corner be rejigged? Yes, it should be. And it doesn't involve the first shot not being high on a, on a non-hit because that, that is just... Again, don't put an impediment in there that allows a player to instantly react and just say, okay, I'm going to log. And now there's going to be, you know, there's going to be nothing at the bottom. I absolutely hate that. But the entire penalty corner, maybe something needs to be done. I really think it does. But um, that's where the situation is at. I know one person on the internets on that discussion brought up the Sam Ward situation and said, well, you know, ask Sam Ward what you think about dangerous shots on goal. And it's like, well, first of all, it was his teammate that hit him. It was a complete fluke accident. And it wasn't even a shot at goal because it was going wide when it hit him. So that is what we just call an absolute accident. And it's awful, but he wasn't intending to smoke it in the top corner from the top of the circle and put his own teammate in danger. It was just a mishit. It's just how it went you, when you watch it fly off a stick. So um, let's see. Jenks, you have points to make. Don't I think on the Duluth, Dutch versus any the defender ran into the path and therefore caused danger to themselves. The Dutch guy had a free shot. Yeah, I, I absolutely consider that, Jenks, but what I think happened there, and I, I think it's quite reasonable for that defender, had he, had the attacker been further away to retrieve that rebound, and that defender just shifts across, and he's like, I'm going to take away this goalie, then I'd say, absolutely. That's when the defender's putting themselves into the path of danger. But instead, he's actually moving you know, with the ball carrier and closing on the ball carrier. It just so happens that he got himself in really tight because that's where the rebound went, or as, as I remember it. So no, I don't think that's a case where the defender is really putting themselves in danger. And I, th I think that's a reasonable, um, I, th I, think that's, I think that's the right balance. I think it's the right calculation, but let me know what you think. Did that, did that persuade you? I have a really hard time persuading Jenks, by the way, everybody. He's very stubborn. Hmm, he says, indeed. Okay, um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to cover in that. The, the crucial point that you want to take home is back to what I said about a defender having the opportunity. Do they have the skill? Do they have the time? Do they have the space? Are there a lot of people around them to protect themselves from that ball or the opportunity to play that ball skillfully? And that will change at every level of play. It can change even with individual players or different teams in the same league. You might have a very highly skilled team that's on the ascendancy and going up the ranks and another team that maybe they had to pick up some players from a lower grade and brought them up for this game. It's very sensitive. It's very, very nuanced, but I, I believe in you guys. I think you can do this. I really think you can do this. So just because something was not, would not be considered to be dangerous at the pro league level does not mean you're not going to make that call at a lower level. That's the important thing. And as somebody, and I, I mean, I, I use high level examples all the time just because the camera works the best and the umpires tend to get them, the decisions right more often than they get them wrong. That also helps. But um, I umpire at very, very low levels as well as having had the experience of umpiring at very, very high levels. So if there's anybody out there that knows what range is, I've done under 12, I've done uh, you know, un 15 year old high school players picking up a stick for the first time. I've done our men's league in Calgary. It's really, really bad. And all the way up to top 10 teams in the world, Junior World Cups, Olympic qualifiers, World Cup qualifiers. So I know it's not easy to make those adjustments, but if you really let yourself go into the flow of the game and you put yourself in the position of all those players, you're going to have a better chance at uh, getting those right. 
Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, Jenks doesn't agree and Martin does agree with that either. And that's okay. That's okay. It, it would be cool if at the international level, uh, somebody was actually over, overly cautious for once, because I think when we get it wrong at that top level, it's more often that we're allowing too much danger, to be totally honest, because we really want to see the exciting play and we want to put our whistles away and we want the players to, you know, to have the rain to show themselves <laughs> when it hits. <laughs> and and uh, Zed's getting a little... <laughs> defensive comments. Like, it is fine. It's fine. I'm talking about when I umpired it years ago. Okay. So I hope that helps. And for Chris Butler, I hope you were watching or you're watching right now on a replay or something like that. I have a feeling you're not going to like my answer either. But this is the consensus throughout the community. Mistakes are made, but this is the spirit that everybody is trying to apply. So I hope that convinces you to umpire in the same spirit as well all right let's move on to the next oh it's 1226 and i have to be out of here at one o'clock for my hair appointment mm. uh just a little quick reminder for you guys that uh i do have the fh empires third team up on the website and you can go to fhu3t.com there's the green membership where you have access to the clip library and all those clips and really nice tasty little discounts on the intensive and workshops that are there. Uh, the yellow level of membership uh, gets you a mentorship in a private Facebook group with me. And it's, I mean, right now, maybe it's not the right time. Totally cool, get it. Because not many people are able to get out there and, and uh, umpire the hockey. And it's, it's, I'm gearing that to be a very much a, you know, continual development plan kind of experience. If you are part of a hockey umpire association, you or a some other kind of uh, national, regional something group, I have a red membership which allows you to have access to the clips that I have produced so that you can use them in your own educational materials. And your members get access to the clip library individually so they can also conduct their education on their own. But you don't have to run around trying to figure out how to put together what I think is one of the most vital pieces of learning material together for your, uh, for your work in your courses. And then there's blue. Jenks knows about the blue membership. He's one of them. And um, you just, you know, buy me a, a Starbucks coffee every month, basically. Just one. It's cool. And I really appreciate that kind of support. It's really going to help. And it's always a little bit going a long way. So Thanks, Jenks, for being a Blue member, and uh, thank you to all of you who have joined up on the various membership levels. I've uh, been really excited about getting this whole package together, and now that the world is in a different place, I'm able to do it. So, awesome sauce. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, James has a has a draft for the new penalty corner rules. I'm not even going to look at it right now because it's probably going to just blow my mind and I'm not there <laughs> okay next topic let's do this early breaking attackers I this was a lovely little question from Eleonora and what a great name Eleonora is I absolutely love that oh man I already messed it up okay don't worry, you guys. I got this. This is why I have a backup. I didn't put it there. Okay, here's the question. We can look at it. A why question, which is my favorite. Why in the P in the penalty corner, if an attacker invades the circle early, the player taking the push has to go to midfield? Thanks. And she's very helpfully outlined the rule for us right there. It's just nicely highlighted. Boom, right there. So this was a change for 2019. Previously to this moment, as soon as we went to sending early breaking people to the central line, it was whichever attacker broke early, they were the ones to go back to the center line. And I guess that the rule committee realized that it wasn't really much of a deterrent because attackers running in, especially when 
they're deflectors who you know don't get used very often um they're not a very specialized position so to risk getting caught doing that and maybe trying to throw off the defense or make them have to run more or take the opportunity to try to induce them into them breaking early and not being and you not getting caught for doing that inducement uh the rules committee decided we got to step this up a notch and they did so by changing the rule in 2019 so that it had to be the oh that's not the right one it had to be the injector go on they're a specialized they're a specialized position there's a lot of focus involved in that and if you take an injection and then all of a sudden the umpire restarts the penalty corner and then you get sent and somebody has to get replaced I and mean, you might not have the right personnel in the field and that can be quite a penalty so here's an example of that in action prior to the rule change you can clearly see due to the top does one of those stutter steps he thinks he's you know he was probably going to be the deflector at the at the p-spot you know that he was going to be laying down a stick and trying to deflect it over the guy and just the timing went off and he was the one who had to go so this was in 2018 at the ehl contrast that to this kind of event um this is pro league and just this year i think this is belgium and new zealand and the penalty corner is restarted and maybe i can turn up the volume so you guys can hear Breaking there. I'm gonna take this back. Okay, so the signal comes from the supporting umpire of the radio. She says, "Break, break, break." And now the discussion is coming. You know, hey, oops, we sent the wrong one. Number eight, uh, Pouvre, She was the injector, and so it gets corrected. Uh, that's a waste, Maybe really, Pouvres, Pouvres, jump. Come on, is it not French? It's got to be Pouvre. And she, and and then they communicate that she is the one that that needs to go, and so they got that corrected. So this was just to create a larger deterrent on that fast breaking, that early breaking attacker on the circle. It's weird. It feels awkward, but I don't mind it. I don't know. Have you had to send a lot of those people? I don't know. I've I've had to do a few, and. And I like it. It feels like you, you're resetting things a little more accurately, if that makes any sense. Any questions about that at all? Let's see. Okay. Nice and easy. Good. I might get out of here in time. You never know. Um, third question. This came from Andy Hadley. And I'm going to have to go back to my iPad because I didn't load these up properly. Life is fun. <laughs> and here we go. This is Andy asking, an accidental collision between players, let's say off the ball, and one player goes to ground, would you always stop play immediately for a suspected head injury? Would there be any situation, i.e. an attacker about to shoot, in which you would allow play to continue for a few seconds, assuming the injured player is not interfering with play. And then Andy, the genius, he sees this clip pop up on the Facebooks and points in my direction, so I was able to go download it. And here's an example of it. what on the very July, well still going. Been. That's a big clash. Play on, Unsworth into the circle, on the reverse stick shot comes in, and it's turned around. I'm sorry, that's very loud. And the umpire chooses to stop play after. This is like a double header for Alicia. Hi, I hope I hope you're doing well, Skippy. And so a bit of a this is really dicey. And to be honest, I at almost any other level of play, I would say no. Just it's just not worth it. We are in a situation in our sport where we've seen a number of high profile players suffering head injuries and concussions on the field. We know that this is an issue throughout the game. 
Um, I don't think it's a, oh my God, you know, let's all run screaming for the hills kind of uh, issue, but it's something that we need to be aware of. And I don't like the thought that a player who is on the ground and disoriented and could benefit from an immediate medical intervention is not looked after. Now, in that particular case, Alicia very well may could have seen that she didn't feel like there was a head injury there and it was just a shoulder uh, shoulder to shoulder because it, it did kind of look like that, that it was just a shoulder to shoulder injury uh, collision. Oh, Keely done. I'm trying to get to the right. There we go. I want to replay the, the clip again. And a really tough call. <laughs> Uh, on the collision as it was. So I can imagine that in that moment, I would have been trying to process, what should I do? Is that a free hit? Is that advantage? Alicia determines its advantage and she actually does the waving it on signal like, yep, let's keep going. And off she goes. So my advice to you would be, and I, this is what I teach in my clinics. This is how we're briefed at the FIH level is that if there is blood or if there is a suspected head injury that you just call time immediately and nothing is really worth playing on. So, I mean, we were lucky that the attacking team got a clean possession of the ball, was able to pass around the two players who were down and it was okay. I certainly don't think there was any possibility that the defender was faking <laughs> that impact. I mean, she got smoked. And, uh, you know, it was probably her fault. And I, I'm, I'm buying Alicia's decision there that it was her fault. And uh, to play on that advantage, you know, at that moment felt like the right thing. But I think that's a very rare situation. And it's not a risk that we're going to take. And I think that it's, it's hard enough to get players to keep going when, you know, somebody gets hit in the hand. Uh, because a ball gets raised at them and you're playing advantage and the player is standing up and they're waving their hand and they're like, umpire, umpire, stop plays. Why? <laughs> you're fine. Walk off the field. <laughs> and it's hard enough to keep that play going. I don't think you're going to have any problems or any objections if there is a potential head injury and you call play right away. So that's what I would look like. Mike D in that case, he, he thought the defender was stationary in that case she also did stick obstruct just before that happened as well so hard to say um there you go yeah a couple of you are are making that assessment here let me put up mike d's comment here and simon agrees that the attacker ran straight into the defender yeah it's uh it's it's hard to say she had uh she had missed the ball there was a stick on stick and in Alicia's view, that was a um, that was an obstruction by the defender. Who knows? <laughs> and that's what Martin's chiming in with. Thanks, buddy, for having my back. Appreciate it. So, if that's clear, I'm gonna move on. But you know, maybe I should just sit here for a while because sometimes your comments come in a little bit later. I keep forgetting the internet isn't completely. Um, I'm trying to, I'm thinking spontaneous, but I mean contemporaneous. It's not instant when the messages come through. There is a bit of delay through the software, so I don't always know. And uh, yeah, Thomas is uh, saying that it could have been a free hit. Okay. Okay, we can argue that, but the point is about the injury. <laughs> Focus, people. Man. Oh, you're like a herd of cats. I'm telling you. Okay. Last topic, we're at 22, so this is perfect. And this came in through, um, I've got a little kind of poll on my website and it's it's something that you can plug your question or your comment into and you, I have no idea who it is unless you ask me to email you back. It, you can put something in completely anonymous so you can say, oh my God, Keely, your understanding of how many stroke rules is so crap and I will never know who was mean. But somebody piped in there and 
asked a question, very general, but I thought it was worth a look at anyway, because it's something that a lot of us think about. And it's something obviously that I, I think about how as a long distance coach mentor type, how can I help people to get to the next level of their umpiring when they're uh, really looking at um, progressing and that sort of thing. So let's, let's talk about this for a few minutes. Obviously, how you progress is going to vary so much from place to place because everybody's got different systems and different levels of umpiring structure and that sort of thing. So I can't obviously tell you what the steps are, but I can tell you how to get the right information about those steps. And the first place you'd want to go to is talk to somebody who's umpiring at the level that you're looking to get to. And if it means that you pop out to a game at that level and you watch the umpires and you go up and introduce yourselves and, you know, sit down at the, you know, at tees afterwards and have that conversation and say, all right, so tell me, like, what's it like to be a level two? How did you get there? How many games have you umpired at the pre, how many games had you umpired at the previous level? What is your overall experience? Get a sense of what an umpire at that next level has done. And a thorough understanding. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to do the same number of things, but it'll give you an idea. So if, for example, if you're at a beginner level and you want to become an FIH umpire and you want to do that tomorrow, the first thing you do is sit down with an FIH umpire and you talk to them and say, okay, well, how did you get there? And they will go through all the levels that they went through. Or if you're me, you kind of skipped a lot and did it really quickly, but I wasn't normal. Okay. Um, you'll find out how long they had been umpiring before they got to each level and to each level and how many games they were doing, how much were they traveling? How much were they working with mentors and coaches, uh, who were physically there? Um, what kind of obstacles did they have to go through? What kind of, what kind of things did they forego in order to reach that level? Did they forego playing on a particular day? Have they stopped playing golf? On the weekend because that allowed them to do the matches that they wanted to do oh i just made somebody mad that's too bad um so what you might find out through that conversation is is that your expectation of what it takes to become an international umpire and how long it should take things like that is maybe a little bit fuzzy and not formed accurately um if you find out that an international umpire got there when they were 25 and you're already 40, you might realize that there's a problem there. And I had this conversation quite a bit actually with people on the internets and they write me out and they're like, I want to be an international. I say, okay, well, how old are you? And they say, oh, I'm 37. I'm like, uh, hockey is, hockey umpiring is ageist. I said it. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of which are, I believe, absolute crap. Some of them make sense. And in general, what an age limit does is it allows the international panels to remain fresh. So you don't have people sticking around forever just because, you know, they've been great at one point in their career and they just, well, they're experienced, like, let's just keep putting them in the games and they end up blocking the progress and the ability for other younger, less experienced umpires to take advantage of those opportunities. It forces, <laughs> it, it allows also these, the FIH to sometimes, it gives them the opportunity maybe to say, thank you very much for your service to somebody who needs to step aside as well, because they haven't been up to the standard for a little bit. It's really hard to take somebody down who's been at a certain level it's really hard to say we don't want you anymore when i was uh when i'd made grade one and i did an olympic qualifier in belgium that was my last major international tournament i i did another one but it wasn't major and that was the one where i needed a particular grade in order to get to the next level which was at the time the world development panel and that would have put me in the top 20 18 umpires in the world 
and I didn't get my mark. And they couldn't really say to me at the time, yeah, you're not going to make it. But that was the message that came through. And it was really, really hard to hear. And I understand it now. Um, but it's really, really hard to tell people and to assess them very bluntly and very objectively. So the retirement age actually gives you that chance. So, I mean, I would have been retired out last year anyway, and they would have gotten rid of me, but I retired a couple years ago anyway, just because I thought, yeah, it's, it's time. And I wanted to pursue umpire managing. So that worked out for me and, uh, always good decisions, but those are some of the things that you need to consider. Talk to people who are higher above you. Oh boy, that was a long tangent. Um, let's see. Something that I see people doing when they're talking about their umpiring careers, and this happens so much on social media because, I mean, we all know it's terrible. And it encourages us to do stupid, it normalizes, I think, really non-helpful behaviors. And I see people talking about a tournament that's in the future and they're like, oh, here's a countdown to this tournament, 365 days to here and hashtag career goals. It's really dangerous to set a goal on something that you cannot control. Your appointment to a tournament or to an event or promotion even is not something within your control. It absolutely isn't. And this is what I get for having a stoic boyfriend. But you have to focus on the behaviors, the habits, the things that you can control, because that's the only way you're gonna keep yourself sane. I spent a lot of time in my umpiring career obsessing over getting this particular mark and getting to this particular tournament and getting this match. And it was awful. I was disappointed so much. I spent all my time thinking about the things that I wasn't getting and wasn't doing and wasn't achieving when I was actually doing really amazing things and improving and growing and, and performing a really wonderful service to the game that when I look back now, I'm really proud of, but I wasn't paying attention to that at the time. And it sucked because I was miserable. I, I didn't enjoy those years because it was always thinking about what I couldn't manage to get for myself. So <laughs> don't think, about don't think about those things think about what would it take what kind of behaviors can you employ that regardless of what it result you you may or may not get whether you get that appointment or not are they going to make you a better umpire so for example this could be um oh i need to scroll that okay good it could be your fitness. So setting fitness goals that you're going to hit this particular measurement on the yo-yo or the sprint test and whatever you need to do in your area, um, that might be something that you want to set a goal for. You might want to set a goal for uh, a self-assessment metric that you can put into your games that I want to set a goal that I take my first management opportunity in every game and you focus on that kind of controllable element. And you might say, okay, I need to watch more video. I need to go into the FH Empire's Cook Library and watch an hour of clips a week, watch half an hour of clips, five clips a week, and train your brain and visualize and watch those things. I'm actually reading a really interesting book right now that I'm gonna put on Mentoring Monday uh, next week. Mentoring Monday is a lot of work for not a lot of payoff. So I'm not going to do one every week now because it's, it's really hard, but I'm, I'm listening to the audiobook of the inner game of tennis, which is a classic sports psychology book by a gentleman named Timothy Galway, Galway. And it's very, very Zen. And I realized as a tennis player, that was the sport that I actually grew up playing. It, it resonates with me on that level, but my brain is constantly spinning about how this could apply to umpiring. And it's just, it's really opening up some amazing doors for me. And it, and it comes to uh, this sort of, how do you keep yourself in the moment and focus on the things that, that are, are meaningful and don't think about the result. 
And so this is kind of a microcosm of that, I guess, that philosophy. So, you know, so pursue your habits that are going to make you a better umpire, the video analysis. Are you seeking out learning opportunities? Are you having discussions with umpire managers and coaches uh, when they're there? Are you engaging in online discussions? Are you bugging me on Feature Friday and Really Tuesday? Um, are you going to team trainings and watching what they're doing? Are you umpiring their scrimmages? So you can work on a particular skill, like for example, your positioning that you learned on a positioning workshop that you're a little worried about trying in a game, but a scrimmage would be oh, friendly. But in a friendly, it would be a great place to try it out. So you've got, um, you've got that, you've got some concrete steps that w are within your control and that are going to make you a better umpire, regardless of what anybody else rewards you with. Because that stuff is arbitrary, it's often political, it's heartbreaking, and you can lose your passion and your love for doing something that really is awesome because it's stuff that other people are doing and do you want that to run your life obviously not like don't don't put yourself there um do you talk to coaches do you seek them out and just talk to them about their views on anything about hockey it doesn't even have to be like rules related it could be you know something about how they're structuring their defense or something and just learning a bit more are you talking to players about what they like about certain umpires and say hey you know remember last week yeah you know what, what was really great about that umpire what did you not like about that day in umpiring and you know learning from that so focus on these kind of actions and set goals around that you can measure that are tangible and actionable smarter goals you can read all this stuff on the internet. There's lots of self-help about it. And I used to think it was a lot of bullshit, but actually it really does make a difference. Especially in an environment where you are feeling out of control. It can just narrow that your world into a place that is still actually inside you and really be rewarding with uh, how you make your way through things. Um, let's see. I'm going to go back to some of these comments because you guys are asking really good questions and I was ranting a bit. So Jade is asking, Jade is saying that, uh, the retirement age should be based on ability regardless of age. Not very inclusive. I mean, you're right. They suspended the retirement age for a couple of years and then, uh, December last year, they spontaneously and without warning re-implemented it and that wasn't pretty there's a lot of things that need to change there and i'm really hoping that um <laughs> that they'll feel themselves in a position to make the investment required in the right personnel so that we have strong and continuous and long-term focused guidance on how we're developing that group of umpires and then communicating everything that's happening in the international to the national associations because we've lost that bridge between the international levels and the national levels and it's a bit of a free-for-all right now and I don't like it it's kind of scary out there and it's kind of what I why I'm doing everything that I'm doing because I'm trying to provide some of that bridge whether they like it or not <laughs> okay let's see Omen. <laughs> dog ears. I read that dog ears don't actually work the way that we thought they did. And it, the whole seven year thing is not true. And there's actually a complicated piece of maths involved. And that's when I tuned out because it's just not my thing. <laughs> I love live. It's so funny. Okay. Steven. Uh, is contributing that Pierre Luigi Colina's autobiography. Pierre Luigi Colina, bald guy, big eyes, had a very big influence on my umpiring. I also read that book and it is fantastic. So I'm saving that for future, future mentoring Monday when I can't think of anything else to talk about <laughs> because it is a classic, 
absolutely go read it um i can't remember what it's called steven if you remember um uh, put it in the uh put in the comments and stoneman's reply is did you copy his hairstyle yes yes he did that is very funny and that brings up this graphic for me oh damn it don't be like that i found all these and they're awesome <laughs> if you don't follow the nfl i don't either this is ed hockley and he's a lawyer he is a lawyer and he is famous for first of all having immense biceps as you can see in that photo and also being really great at explaining his decisions over the pa very articulate obviously he's used to making submissions in court and there he is he's been memorialized in a series of memes that i'm going to be bringing out all the time so stoneman that's a foul that's a personal foul on uh stephen cox and uh you you've been you've been called for an ad hominem attack on his hair the rules of the game steven says let me put that up on the broadcast that is pierre luigi colina's book so yeah reading books listening to podcasts um part of what i'm trying to do with mentoring monday and also on the private group um for the yellow membership is that i'm trying to bring these resources and guide umpires through them in a way that is applicable because i'm i'm bringing in influences from all kinds of different walks of life and different areas of education and science and philosophy and and that sort of thing because it's fun and it is helpful and it can really open your your eyes and freshen up your perspective on what can be a really really tough slog let's face it it's i'm finding can be really really challenging so i want to support you guys and and do some of that work to be able to lead you through almost like a master's course on you know how to get better at whatever level you're at so um have a look at colina's book for sure and look out for my uh interpretation of one small element of the inner game of tennis by tim galway galway uh on the next mentoring monday so um that is all of the questions that i'm going to address this week next week i have another super easy one penalty strokes dragged uh or hit how do you make those determinations oh my god this is going to be the worst because nobody agrees with me on this one and it's quite troubling um uh, we've got a couple there's a couple comments here that i'm going to go through let's see kelly has to call <laughs> call a foul okay michael proactively preventing danger can you protect player safety blowing before a shot legit in my view if you believe as a player is incapacitated blah 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 restart with a bully yes that is the correct result that you would go if there was no foul and the ball was just in the middle of play absolutely you'd restart with a bully and then you'd walk up to the two players and say would you please give the ball back to the team that had possession because that would be cool it's something that uh, i apparently gets i see it done in in football and in hockey at the top levels it's quite standard but sometimes it doesn't happen and i'm like i'm shocked it's like oh that's rude girl no that ball had to go back to the other team and they're fighting it out bullies are dumb you guys i don't care Matt John bringing back the bully on the reverse stick podcast. No, I'm sorry. It's not a great way to contest the ball. So, hopefully, it, with a little bit of encouragement, you'll get your uh get your players to do the right thing with the ball, but um yeah, it's it's just better to preserve safety in those uh those things. <laughs> let's see james is just mentioning that he'd seen those me memes of ed hockley didn't know who it was oh dude i can i can write essays on ed hockley there's also an nhl referee that i'm absolutely in love with and i'm trying to remember like massive crush on him cuz he's hilarious and i put him on twitter all the time whenever i see clips of him doing his thing and you you've got to love the personality and i hope this is something that we can embrace a bit more in our game is the person personalities. I even like watching clips of is it Mike Dean? He's a EPL football referee. 
uh, Dean, and he's just celebrity reps puts him up all the time, and he's so much fun to watch. And anybody who brings that sense of sass and personality to what they're doing, it's not disrespectful to the game. Well, usually, I mean, sometimes it gets in trouble, but uh, and any of these guys, Wes McCauley, he's the NHL referee. I think. If you can bring that personality and that enjoyment and just fill out the fact that we are people as well and draw attention to that, I think is really nice and something we should do more in our game. We don't have to be robots. We don't want to take over the game. The game is about the players. We know that, but it's like it's like a, a side side salad or it's it's like a, a reduction sauce. Sure, you can eat without that, but it just adds that little extra flavor to that one little bit of the dish. So let's be a reduction or a mousse or something. Okay. Oh, Andy, since this is your question, I really better address this. What I want, okay. With a head injury or big collisions and hard falls, I will usually stop playing, make any excuses. Yeah, absolutely. Players are not going to be mad. They really aren't. They would make themselves look really like jerks won't be a problem uh and james is also mentioning nigel owens in uk rugby yeah we all know and love mr owens there we go okay that is it for today's episode of what up wednesday i hope i got all the rules right even if i didn't get all the interpretations right according to uh jenks on dangerous shots on goal and perhaps many, many, many others. But I have been confident in my interpretation of this for quite some time. So I like it. Tell me I'm wrong. And what's coming up? Um, on Friday, I will have figured out exactly what I'm going to do with the next workshop, which will be coming at the end of August on a Wednesday, because this is a good time slot for me to do stuff. And if you are interested in the workshops that I do but can't join in live, they are available as intensives on the website. So you can go check them out there. Last week's positioning workshop is just a couple days away from getting back up there. If I didn't have to do re redo Ruby Tuesday yesterday, I would have had it done by now, but this is what happens. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. You can uh, hop on and go to fhempires.com and subscribe to the newsletter or just keep watching the socials as you guys always do. I love hearing from you again. So please keep commenting. Send me those DMs. You can text me on WhatsApp, except that one guy. Sorry, you're not asking me umpiring questions. And um, I will be very happy to uh, have a dialogue with you and you're very welcome Stephen. very welcome to all of you i had a great time again today and i will see you next time on what up wednesday ciao for now guys bye